Texas Lutheran University. I want to welcome uh, Jennifer Irvin. She is from uh, Texas State. She comes via uh, Texas State, actually, for her bachelor's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got her PhD at the University of Florida, did postdoc work at the uh, Satsedia Labs, and also worked for the Naval Air Warfare Station, uh, Warfare Center, excuse me. Um, and she's going to be talking about electroactive polymers and application-driven processing. Let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Irvin. Thank you. Okay, so obviously the research that I do, it's not just me. So there are a bunch of people up there that um, I work with, including uh, the research group of Tanya Betancourt, who is a biomedical engineer, and James Tunnell, who is um, like an optics guy up at UT. And so you'll see people up here from all these different places. Um, you live here, so you've all been to San Marcos, right? So pretty place. Most people are, are amazed by all the rivers and, and things. Um, but as chem majors, let's see if now it'll go. Yeah, there we go. As chem majors, we don't spend a lot of time, I think, uh, at Sewell Park, sunbathing like all the business majors and, and uh, fashion merchandising majors do. Um, so it's a little bit different life, I think, for our students. They don't get to do quite as much of that. But uh, we are a huge university compared to this one. There are close to 39,000 students this semester. Uh, we are what's listed as an emerging research university, meaning we're not quite UT, but you know we, we have a lot of research activity going on. We're also a Hispanic-serving institution. And this year, for the first time ever, we are a majority-minority school, meaning that most of our students are some sort of minority. Um, we have a lot of different degree programs, 98 bachelors, 90 masters. I think there are now 13 doctoral programs. Uh, one of them is the Material Science, Engineering, and Commercialization, or MSEC program, which I am the director of. Uh, that's a PhD program where students get a chance to do material science and engineering. So they're coming from a bunch of different backgrounds, chemistry, physics, biochemistry, engineering. Um, and then in addition to learning the science, they're also taking some business classes. So they're learning when they graduate, they can go out and be able to market their science. Right? So they can start up their own business or they can help a company to succeed. Um, in, in their developing their product. Uh, that program, you do have to have a master's degree to get into. Um, I've got some brochures up here on it, but you guys are all undergrads, right? So, um, so you might be interested in the master's program at Texas State. We offer master's degrees in chemistry and biochemistry. Um, you need a 300 on the GRE to get in. You need a 3.0 GPA in your last 60 hours and standard stuff, letters of recommendation and you know what you want to do with your life. Uh, we don't pay tuition. We do, however, give assistantships of about $1,500 a month at the master's level. Um, at the doctoral level, we're paying our doctoral students about $33,000 a year to go to school. They're still paying their tuition out of that, which is a little bit less than $10,000 um, a year. Actually, it's less than $9,000 a year. Um, if you want to apply to the master's program, if you're graduating from here and you meet those requirements, you probably stand a very, very good chance of getting in. So I have a bunch of brochures here. The maroon ones are about the master's program, if you're interested. Um, priority deadline just means that gives you a better chance of getting some of our fellowships. Um, so we give away two or three really good fellowships uh, to, to our master's students. You would be for your assistantship teaching labs or doing research. Um, Chad Booth is the director of that program, so you can uh, certainly contact him if you have any more questions. Uh, one of the traditions at Texas State is a lot of the graduates, when they finish up, jump into the river in their regalia. Um, so this is three of my students here jumping in after they graduated. One of them's plugging her nose. Um, so completely switching gears now. My background is organic chemistry. I have a PhD in organic chemistry, uh, but my specialty is polymers. And you know, that's plastics. That's your chairs that you're sitting on there and your tennis shoes and all that stuff. Um, the particular type of polymers that I work on are electroactive polymers, also known as conjugated polymers or conducting polymers or inherently conducting polymers. We're not talking about here sticking carbon into rubber to make it conductive. We're talking about polymers that are all by themselves going to be conductive. Uh, 
so they'll switch reversibly between insulating and conducting states based on adding and removing electrons. And this happens because they're highly conjugated species, and I'll show you that in a bit. Um, this, this work got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2000. It's been quite a while now. So it's, so it's now a mature technology, meaning there are a lot of different applications. All the ones here that have asterisks by them, you can buy commercial devices that contain conducting polymers. This isn't some pipe dream anymore. These things are out there. Um, but we're talking about applications in sensors, any sort of displays, electronic technologies. Um, drug delivery, actuators, meaning things that move when you apply an electric field, all kinds of applications uh, for these things. And what you'll see is, I'll talk about one specific application today, but, but most of the research that we're doing, we can apply to any of these different applications just by changing, because we're working on fundamental property understanding, which will help us to make any of these things better, pretty much. Um, here's some common polymers. Polyacetylene was the, the first one. Uh, that people really understood, although you could argue that polyaniline is the one that's been around the longest uh, since the 1800s. People just didn't know what it was. Uh, so there are a bunch of these common polymers, but we don't generally work with any of these. We work with ones that we're making ourselves because we're changing the properties. We're changing the chemical structure to tailor the properties of the polymers to get what we want out. So, uh, but these are the fundamental ones that people started with. Oops, here we, how do we jump way fast? Okay, so, so if we look at any of these polymers and call it P, polymer in the neutral state has no charge whatsoever. I can remove electrons from it and make it positively charged. That's called P-doping for positive doping. Um, I can put those electrons back in and go back to the neutral state. Usually the P-doping process is really, really reversible, repeatable. It can happen millions of times without any sort of degradation in that process. Uh, works really, really well. Now the polymer in the neutral state is insulating and in the charged state is conductive. We could also, though, at least theoretically, put electrons into that polymer and make it negatively charged. And then we'd like to be able to go back and forth with that millions of times, too. However, if you remember your organic chemistry, putting negative charges on carbon doesn't work very well. Carbanions are, are, carbanions are notoriously unstable. And so trying to make polymers that will do this reproducibly turns out to be very challenging. And so a lot of work goes into that. We got this P-doping part down really, really well, but there aren't a lot of very good stable end-dopers out there. So anytime we're changing the oxidation state of these polymers, we're going to see changes in the properties because we're changing the conjugation. Um, we're going from a conoidal state to an aromatic state or vice versa. Um, and so we're going to see changes in conductivity. Again, the, the neutral one is not conductive, but both of the charged ones are. Um, so changes in conductivity, that's, that's sensors, that's memory devices, storage devices. Changes in color, that's electrochromics, display technologies, um, LEDs, things like that. Changes in volume, if you can apply a voltage and have something change its volume, that's an actuator. And so we're talking most likely about MEMS, microelectronic, microelectronic mechanical systems. There we go. So little teeny tiny robots you could imagine that just by changing a voltage, you could make them move. Um, they could also be artificial muscles um, for, for people with injuries or artificial nerves. Uh, they're changing reactivity, which means they're useful for sensors. Permeability means they're useful for things like gas separation or water purification, um, also drug delivery. Changing solubility, I put it on here because the solubility absolutely changes, but so far I don't know of any way that this is useful in an application. <laughs> um, but but it, it is a fact that, that, that solubility will change. Um, so if we just take very simply thiophene that you've got over here. Thiophene, if we remove an electron from it, we form a resonance stabilized radical cation. It's a lot like benzene in terms of resonance stabilization. So we can form this resonance stabilized radical cation, and then that can react with another molecule of thiophene, or it can react with another resonance stabilized monomer cation. So if it reacts with a monomer, that's radical monomer coupling, and we form a radical cation dimer, which can lose another electron to form a dicationic dimer. Two radical cations can come together to form a dicationic dimer. In either case, we're losing two electrons. Um, the result, after we lose a couple protons, is bithiophene here. 
by thiophene, now you can imagine if we were to remove an electron from this, there'd be a lot more resonance contributors, right? So you could, you could draw way more of these than just those three. And because we have more resonance contributors, it's a lot easier to remove an electron, a lot easier to oxidize the dimer than it was the monomer. So that means the dimer's more reactive than the monomer, the trimer's more reactive than the dimer. It makes it really, really easy to get these things to polymerize and get to high molecular weights relatively quickly. So we do this over and over again, whether it's chemically or electrochemically, and we can produce uh, reasonable polymers in a very, very rapid amount of time. I'm talking seconds that we can make these things. Um, again, we're going to initially form the polymer um, in a charged state like this, and we can neutralize it to get to the neutral polymer. Um, so just to show you what it looks like, if we want to do electrochemical polymerization, and you guys, just, just let me know who here has done any electrochemistry. Probably, yeah, you want to, right? So you don't do a lot of that, and you don't even study it a lot as a chem major anymore, right? You learned about it a tiny bit in gen chem, and maybe if you had a good analytical class, that was taught. But I mean, at Texas State, they just completely cut that out of the curriculum. But electrochemistry is crucial to somebody who does conducting polymers. And so if we look here, we've got 3,4-ethylene dioxythiophene. Those X oxygens down there are dumping more electron density and making this easier to oxidize. Um, so we call that E dot. E dot, if we remove an electron, forms poly E dot in the doped state. We can put an electron back in and form the neutral poly E dot. And so you can see the structure over here for P dot, we call it. Um, if we look at the polymerization, anytime we do electrochemistry, we've got cyclic voltammetry here. We've got current on the y-axis, and we've got voltage on the x-axis. So all we're doing is cycling from our negative voltage up to a higher voltage. And at some point, we're going to have a big enough difference, potential difference, that we're going to be able to suck electrons out of our monomer and form that radical cation. And so how easily you can do that is based on things like, do you have electron donating groups there to stabilize the radical cation that you're forming? And so here we can see nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. We get up here at about 1.3 volts. That's the onset of monomer oxidation. And once we hit that voltage, we see a huge increase in current. Current is passing because we're removing electrons. And so we're getting electron flow. And so up here, we're peaking at about 1.7 volts. Then we immediately cycle back. And when we cycle back, we don't see monomer oxidation, which is what this is. We start to see polymer reduction. So we form the polymer on the electrode. The polymer is reducing down to the neutral state. And so we see this reductive process, sometimes one, sometimes two, um, depending on what the polymer is and how well defined it is. So we get back to zero, and now we've got neutral polymer on our electrode. And this electrode is sitting in a solution of the monomer. right? So then if we cycle back again, we see here at a lower potential this, this current pass. What is that? That is the polymer oxidizing. Remember, the polymer is a lot easier to remove ox electrons from than the monomer is. And so that happens at a lower oxidation potential. So this is polymer oxidation. We keep going, we get more monomer oxidation. And each time we do this, we get more and more polymer building up on the electrode. So the current response gets bigger and bigger and bigger because there's more there. And so we're putting out a bunch of layers of polymer. We usually do this maybe five cycles, something like that. And then we've got a nice film of polymer that we can study. And so we can see in here sort of, here's the polymer process, and over here's the monomer process. But if we want to study the polymer, we want to make sure there's no monomer there to get in the way, because it's obviously swamping all the other stuff. So we take our electrode that has the polymer film on it. We rinse off all the solution that's there using a monomer-free electrolyte solution, because we have to have electrolyte. So we can have ions that compensate for that charge. And then we study the electrochemistry of the polymer in the monomer-free electrolyte solution. And we see pretty much the same thing. Now we're doing this at a bunch of different scan rates. Over here, all of this was at the same scan rate, and this was just five cycles. Here we've got five separate cycles, each at a different scan rate. And what we're seeing is that a linear increase in scan rate results in a linear increase in current response. That tells us the polymer is electroactive and it's adhered to the electrode. The other thing that we can see from this is the polymer oxidation peak potential is at about 0.24 volts. Again, much lower than the monomer at 1.7. And the polymer reduction is at negative 0.55 volts. So this is a pretty easy polymer to get to oxidize and reduce. Um, so this is just a typical cyclic voltammogram so you can see what's going on here. I'm just going to flash through all the rest of them when you see them and just point out the differences. So the differences between these polymers in the neutral state and the doped state are going to be very, very pronounced, which are what are going to lead to all those different applications. So if I want to make a commercial device, let's say I want to make an energy storage device, a capacitor, and I want that capacitor to um, 
I want to make millions of them. I'm not going to do that by electrochemical polymerization. That is a slow, tedious process. It's, it's labor intensive and it would waste a lot of chemicals. We don't want to do that. And so instead what we're going to want to do is have, we're going to want to make the polymer by some sort of solution deposited method, and, uh, solution polymerization, and then we're going to want to cast films, just like when you're, when you're spraying paint, right? The same exact sort of thing. We want to be able to spray a polymer solution, have the solvent evaporate, leave a polymer film behind. So you can see here sort of a rendition of how this might work, spray deposition on a reel-to-reel -reel process where we're putting a coating of this polymer on a plastic substrate. Just by the way, the number one biggest application of conducting polymers is in photographic film. Yes, I know we all use our phones now to take pictures, but professionals still sometimes use film, right? Uh, movie producers, things like that. All of that photographic film that they use, every single reel of that is coated with that polyethylene dioxythiophene that I showed you. Why? Because if not, that reel-to-reel -reel process generates enough static that it burns down film production manufacturer. So if somebody's making film, their plant will burn down if they don't put some static dissipating coating on it. So they coat them all with this conducting polymer, just like you see right here. The problem is solution cast films don't always perform the same way that their electrochemically deposited films do. Um, so if I take the same polymer, dissolve it up and cast it on an electrode and compare that to one that I did solution, uh, that, I, that I electrochemically deposited, the one that was solution cast is never going to be as good as the one that was deposited electrochemically. And so when I was a grad student, I'd be like, I, I just don't understand this, boss. And, and my research advisor, really, really brilliant man, don't get me wrong, said, eh, it's just not adhered as well to the electrode. If you solution cast, those films are just barely on there. But if you electrochemically deposit, you have a lot better adhesion. Now, I've done adhesion studies. I know that's not true. These, these films stick really nicely to the substrate if you prepare the substrate, right? But they still don't perform as well. And so I started thinking about this, and I, and I think it comes down to morphology, right? The morphology of the film that is solution cast is different from the morphology of the film that is um, electrochemically deposited. And so um, I didn't think a whole lot about it until years later when I started working with a solution deposited polymer, and it wasn't working as well. Um, so, so to understand why we have to go back and say, this is a little bit more complicated version than what you saw before, because now we've got the ions in here. Remember, we can't have pluses without minuses. This is chemistry, right? For every cation, there must be an anion. So for this neutral polymer to become this positively charged polymer, we have to have an electrolyte. Some anion has to come from the solution to compensate for that charge on that polymer. For every single positive charge, there has to be a negative. And the same thing going the other direction. So what that electrolyte is, what we choose for CNA, determines all kinds of things about the polymer, how stable it is, how quickly it can switch, um, where it switches, what the oxidation and reduction potentials are, and it can, in fact, impact the morphology of the film. And so choosing the right electrolyte is really, really important um, for all electrochemical applications. That said, I got to grad school and my boss said, use tetrabutyl ammonium perchlorate. That's what we use for everything. It works. If it doesn't work, come see me. We'll come up with something else, right? Um, and that's a very, very normal response. You find something that works and you stick with it and you don't ever investigate anything else. Well, so what do we use? We're typically using a molecular electrolyte solution. And if I asked you to give me an example of a salt, what would you say? Give me a single salt. I mean, they're all up here. Sodium chloride, right, is the one that, that you probably think of first as salt. The problem is our, our monomers that we're doing this experiment on, they're not soluble in water. Sodium chloride is soluble in water. We're not using sodium chloride for our electrolyte. We're using some organic salt so that it, like dissolves like, will be dissolved in our organic solvent. So these are usually tetraalkyl ammonium salts. Um, ethyl, butyl, doesn't matter, methyl. Um, the counter ions can be tetrafluorophosphate, te um, hexafluorophosphate, tetrafluoroborate, um, perchlorate, we use a lot. Um, but they all have to be dissolved in a solvent. And so how they behave depends on the temperature, right? Solution properties are highly dependent on temperature. If I heat my device up a lot, what happens? The solvent evaporates. The, I the salt precipitates out. If it precipitates out in your film, it blasts the film into little bits and it falls apart. Um, if it gets cold, batteries don't work very well when it's cold, right, or when it's hot, right? If it gets cold, the salt precipitates out because its solubility decreases, and we have the same problem. So these things work really great right around room temperature, 
But if it's a volatile solvent at all, like acetonitrile, which is what we usually use, that doesn't last in a long-term device. You want to make something that works for a million cycles. You're not going to use tetrabutyl ammonium perchlorate in acetonitrile because it's just not going to be that stable. And so people have moved to the area of ionic liquid electrolytes. An ionic liquid is an organic salt that is liquid at room temperature. Why is it liquid? Because it's big and fluffy. It's got big fluffy cations, big fluffy anions. They can't get together and crystallize because they've got too much junk out there. Not like sodium chloride where they can form a really nice crystal lattice. And so a couple examples here. We've got ethyl methyl imidazolium, bis because there are two of them, trifluoromethyl sulfonyl imid which is why we call it EMIBTI. And then next to it, we've got the butyl methyl pyrrolidinium uh, BTI as well. So these are just a couple examples of ionic liquids. These are by themselves liquids at room temperature. Um, they don't necessarily have to be dissolved in a solvent, although they are fairly viscous, so dissolving them is helpful. Um, they can be used over a wide temperature use window because we don't have to worry about precipitation. Um, and so you can see now we can really start getting to those million cycle stabilities because there isn't any solvent evaporation to worry about. So a lot of work has gone into um, to looking into these ionic liquids as electrolytes for electrochemistry. But which one do you choose? Right here there are 134 from Sigma Aldrich. Okay? They will not all work for electrochemistry. How do you know which one to choose? And so you have to consider a bunch of things. The conductivity, you want that as high as possible. The viscosity, you want that as low as possible. Um, the voltage window, you want that as broad as possible so you can do as much electrochemistry as, as possible. Um, temperature window, you don't want it to solidify too quickly. or, or uh, so, so you want to try to get that as broad as possible. Um, you want them to be hydrophobic because if they soak up water, they're probably going to result in your device falling apart sooner. And um, you, of course, don't want them to react with your monomer in any way. And so from that 134, we're down to four based on that. And those four, they're still not that great. I mean, you start looking at these viscosities. The only way I'm going to use hexamethylimidazolium hexafluorophosphate is going to be if I'm going to dissolve that in a solvent because it's so, vis so viscous, it's not going to be useful for electrochemistry. But I might be mixing it. Um, so, so really, two or three that are really useful, and that's about it. Um, what difference does it make? Well, here we can see we've made a capacitor, and on one of the electrodes we have P dot, which I showed you before, and on the other one we have something very, very similar. We call it pro dot because instead of ethylene dioxy, it's propylene dioxythiophene. Um, and we've made a capacitor with these, and we've used a molecular electrolyte solution being this lithium BTI, the blue trace, and we're looking now at the capacity as a function of number of cycles, and you can see that the one that's in the molecular electrolyte solution, over 40,000 cycles, it's lost about 35% of its capacity. It's not very stable. It's degrading um, relatively quickly. And so if we replace that lithium BTI with that ionic liquid electrolyte, we can see less than 2% loss after 50,000 cycles. Um, so, so it makes a huge difference to device stability to get away from those electro electrolyte solutions and move to the ionic liquids. Um, you can see here we've got on the left a uh, molecular electrolyte solution. On the right, everything's exactly the same except we've changed the electrolyte. And we're looking at cyclic voltammograms again. And you can see way less current response in the tetrabutyl ammonium hexafluorophosphate than in that ionic liquid, the EMI BTI that you see here. And notice also that the morphology of these films is very, very different. And so just by changing the electrolyte, we can change the electroactivity. And we can change the morphology of the film. So can we control the morphology on purpose? And by controlling the morphology, control the electroactivity, make a better sensor, or store more energy in a battery or a capacitor? Um, and I will say, yes, you can. So if we think about for, if we're doing an electrochemical polymerization, we're depositing polymer on the electrode, we're cycling back, we're putting more polymer on. Each time we do this, ions are moving in and out of the film. And so we're building that polymer around channels for those ions to move in and out. So we're building the ideal morphology for ion movement. If we compare that to what's called uh, potentiostatic electropolymerization, where we hold it at a fixed voltage until a certain amount of current is passed, the, the ions are there as the polymers form, but we're not building in those channels. And those tend to perform not quite as well. So you might imagine instead of getting all these sort of channels, you get these little pockets of ions. If we do traditional solution casting, dissolve a polymer in a solvent, pour it on an electrode, um, we get 
a very dense film. And so what we've said is, well, can we do a solution to positive process where we're incorporating something to give us some sort of better morphology? And if we're lucky, it won't just be these isolated pores. It might be closer to this over here where we've got these continuous pathways throughout the polymer film of where, where these channels are for those ions to move in and out. And so that's what we have done is focused on this part here, depositing the polymer around a template that we'll call a porogen because it's generating pores. And then we'll remove the template after and be left with this. Um, so this could be a hard template. People have done this um, at the national labs using micro machine structures, um, struts and things. It could be deposited around nanoparticles and then dissolve those nanoparticles away later because they're soluble in a different solvent. Um, but that doesn't tend to work as well because there are some problems in terms of getting rid of that template. Instead, you can work with a soft template where we're adding either some other polymer or, in our case, an immiscible liquid, which we call a porogen, to try to generate these pores throughout the polymer film. So here's how our process works. We have a polymer that we dissolve in a solvent, a good solvent for the polymer. We're going to add the porogen. What's the porogen? It's going to be something that is a non-solvent for the polymer. So we add this porogen to that polymer solution, and we get this mixture. We cast a film, and at first we still have the solvent and the porogen there. We then remove the solvent, leaving the porogen behind. How do we do that? We have to have a difference in boiling points, right? So if the solvent has a lower boiling point than the porogen, we can pull a vacuum, remove the solvent, leave behind the polymer with the porogen. Now the polymer doesn't dissolve in the porogen, and so it's going to solidify around all of those pores. And then we need to be able to remove that porogen. And how we remove that porogen, it could be heating it up to a higher temperature, or if it's an ionic liquid, then it might just be washing it out. Um, so we've done that. And so like I said, this, this started, I started looking at this further because we were trying to make this polymer polybenzimidazobenzophenanthylene. Okay? It's a mouthful. BBL is what we call it. BBL was developed um, by the Air Force in the 50s as an aerospace polymer. And their idea was it would be more stable if they used ladder polymers, meaning each repeat unit is connected to the, to the next repeat unit in two locations instead of just one increasing stability. Now notice about this, again, it's a fully conjugated system, just like those conducting polymers we looked at before. <coughs> and now it has a lot of nitrogens in it, which um, are a lot better than carbon at stabilizing a negative charge, right? Nitrogen's more electronegative than carbon. That one position makes a big difference. So sticking a lot of nitrogens in here, along with all that conjugation, is going to give us more stable end-doping polymers. That was our goal, more stable end-doping polymer to make a battery or a capacitor with a wider voltage window so you could, you could power more things. Um, so we started working on this polymer, BBL, and what we found was that they were incredibly stable. They didn't degrade at all. They did a great job of stabilizing the negative charge. Unfortunately, their capacities were really low. So they started out at about 1 millicoulomb per square centimeter. That's just a measure of capacitance. By 1,000 cycles, it actually builds up. It gets a little bit better, and it levels off at about 20 millicoulombs per square centimeter, and it never gets any better than that. We'd really ultimately like this to be 10 times higher, right? So, so yeah, it's stable, but it's not very good. <laughs> so we said, well, maybe that's because we have these dense polymer films. Because the difference between this and what you saw earlier, this is not electrochemically deposited. This is a condensation polymerization. It's only formed, uh, the two monomers here are dissolved in polyphosphoric acid, which is not something you really want to do chemistry and if you can help it, it's nasty stuff. Um, and the polymer that you make, BBL, is only soluble in polyphosphoric acid or methane sulfonic acid. And so um, we're preparing this polymer, we're dissolving it up in methane sulfonic acid and casting films of it. And then it just doesn't work very well. So we said, well, maybe it's because our film is just really, really dense. Can we change the properties of this polymer film? Can we add the ionic liquid electrolyte to the polymer film during to the polymer solution during the casting process, cast out the polymer with the, with the ionic liquid, remove the solvent, and be left with, with the electrolyte we need already in this polymer. And so that's what we tried, which is essentially the templating that I just showed you. Um, and so we're using this EMI-BTI as our porogen. And um, what you'll see is that EMI-BTI and methane sulfonic acid are immiscible at room temperature, but at 90 degrees C, 
we can dissolve the polymer in the methane sulfonic acid and the EMI BTI when added to it um, doesn't phase separate. So we have a homogeneous mixture at 90 degrees C. I'm hesitant to call it a solution, but maybe it's a solution. Um, and then we cast films. We can remove, and, and the density turns out, I think, to be important. We can remove methane sulfonic acid. Its boiling point is 167 degrees, so we're pulling that off under vacuum with high heat. Just a little caveat here if you're doing this at home, you need to be really, really careful to trap your vacuum pump because you don't really want methane sulfonic acid eating your vacuum pump, right? So, um, so we have to be really careful with that. Um, and then the EMI BTI, as I said, it's, it's an ionic liquid. It doesn't really have any transitions below 400 degrees where it starts to decompose. And so we have to wash this out when we're done with methanol. Um, Notice, all the densities here, the BBL, the methane sulfonic acid, the EMI BTA, they're all about 1.5, which I think is, is kind of important. So how much do we use? How much of this porogen, this ionic liquid, do we put in here? And so we went to the block copolymer literature. Uh, Christoph Matuszewski is a pretty smart guy, and he figured out that as you increase, and this is a block copolymer now, it's not the same as what we're doing, but we went to this as a, as a good starting point. And um, what he said was as you increase the amount of, of a phase in a polymer. You'll start with little isolated areas of it, and, and they will coalesce into um, essentially cylinders. Those cylinders will then start to expand even further and form these co-continuous networks. So if you imagine that instead of two polymers here, the red is the polymer and the blue is the pores, now we would have a continuous path for ions to move in and out of this polymer from one side to the other. And so that would give us a way of being able to make sure our polymer is much more electroactive. Um, you get much beyond that and it starts just switching back in the other direction. So we wanted to be right about here, which is 28 to 34 um, percent uh, by volume of in, in the block copolymers, having two separate block copolymers. Don't know if that's going to work exactly the same for our polymers, but let's just start there. And so that's exactly what we did. We targeted 34 volume percent, which is 35 weight percent of the ionic liquid added during the film casting process. So our solution was 99 percent solvent, and then the remaining 1 percent was either just the polymer by itself or 35 percent ionic liquid, 65 percent polymer. All right, so just a little tiny bit. I mean, we're talking about milligrams of stuff here. Um, we heated this for, and stirred it for 10 hours at 90 degrees. And then what you see on the left here is the resultant film after we've dried it, removed all of the solvent, and looked at it in the scanning electron microscope. What we see is the film that was cast without any ionic liquid. It's a relatively smooth surface. Over here is the one that was cast with the ionic liquid. And you see a lot of surface roughness. Now, at this point, I wasn't smart enough to say I should take a cross section of this and see if it's actually porous. Ah, that would have been smart. Later, I thought about that. Um, and so, so we made this lovely, rough surfaced polymer. And then we looked at the electrochemistry. One other thing I want to mention here, though, in addition to doing SCM, we have a capability called EDAX, which is essentially element mapping. So it lets you look at something like this in the electron microscope and say, show me where the fluorine is, show me where the carbon is. And if you'll notice the structure of our polymer, it's carbon, it's nitrogen, it's oxygen, it's hydrogen. That's it. This ionic liquid has all of those things, but it also has um, sulfur and fluorine. And so what we did was EDAX looking for fluorine content. And what we found was there was absolutely no fluorine left in here. And so imagine if we had isolated areas of this ionic liquid throughout the polymer film and we tried to wash it out with methanol, probably there would still be some trapped uh, ionic liquid in there. And we'd see fluorine, but we don't see any fluorine. So that suggests to us that perhaps we have, eh, she doesn't, yeah. So it suggests to us that perhaps we have these, the co-continuous matrix that we were talking about so that we could in fact wash out all the methanol. Oh, and by the way, we treated both films with methanol just so that they were treated exactly the same except for the ionic liquid. Um, and so what we did was we cast these in such a way that we ensured that we had the same amount of polymer, the same mass of polymer on both electrodes, so that when we studied their electrochemistry, they were exactly the same. Uh, and so the green trace here is a cyclovoltamogram of the polymer that was prepared without the ionic liquid. The pink one is the one that was prepared with the ionic liquid. And you see much more current response. So that says for the same mass of polymer, that film that was templated is much more electroactive. 
And this is like the second cycle. Just, just FYI, when you do cycle voltammetry, the first scan is always useless. You throw it away. You start with the second scan. That's the one that really tells you stuff. And so this is, these are both the second cycle for that polymer. But what happens to it over time? Does it get any better, any worse, whatever? And so here and now we're looking at the capacity, which is just the area under this curve. And the green trace here is the polymer without the ionic liquid. And you can see it started at 1 millicoulomb per square centimeter. And after 1,000 cycles, it was up to 20 millicoulombs a square centimeter. And I showed you that before. And that's where it levels off. It doesn't ever get any better. So you can imagine you've got this polymer film. You're exposing it to the electrolyte. Each time, maybe that electrolyte gets a little further into the polymer film, but it never really can penetrate the entire volume of the film because it's just too dense. With the templated film, however, it starts out way higher and stays way higher. So this is exactly what we were hoping to see and what we did see. So we got our capacity up really significantly higher so that we could make, in fact, a good, stable um, capacitor out of this. So then the question is, can you do this with other polymers? So we started with poly-3-hexylthiophene being a soluble conducting polymer that's pretty ubiquitous. People use it for all kinds of things. Um, and we tried the exact same thing with the ionic liquid. We dissolved this now in chloroform, not methane sulfonic acid. We dissolved the polymer in chloroform, added the EMIBTI to it, and tried to cast a film. What we got, instead of the, the porous structure, we got a really nice film of P3HD floating on the top of a layer of ionic liquid. Okay? So that was where I went, hmm, maybe the density is important after all. OK, so, so the density of P3HT is about 1.1 versus that ionic liquid being 1.5. Remember, the BBL was about 1.5 as well. So I think that's probably what's going on there. Um, and so we said, well, what else could we use? Does it actually have to be the ionic liquid? We washed it out. It's not like it matters what that chemistry is significantly. So could we try something else? And so we looked at a lot of things, and we settled on dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO, which has a density of 1.1, the same as the polymer. Um, the polymer does not dissolve in DMSO. That's very, very important, right? We need a non-solvent for the polymer. Um, but the polymer dissolves in chloroform. Both the DMSO and chloroform, they're miscible with each other. So we can dissolve the polymer in chloroform, add DMSO to it, and again, have, have a homogeneous solution. Um, we can then cast the films just like we did before. And now chloroform boils at 61 degrees, so we can pull that off with relatively uh, relatively easily with almost no heat. Um, and then after we've given the polymer a chance to precipitate around that porogen, being the DMSO, we can remove the DMSO um, at higher temperature. Now, we don't wash it with methanol at this point. All we have to do is increase the temperature, and we can pull the DMSO off under vacuum. Um, and so again, same thing, 28 to 34 percent. So our 1 percent is now either just P3HT or it's a mixture of P3HT and DMSO. And we started, we did a bunch of different concentrations this time to see if it made a difference, to see if, if we could control, um, control that better. And so we cast a bunch of different mixtures and uh, looked at the films. And here you can just see a bunch of them sitting in the oven. So 50 degrees under vacuum for 12 hours, 150 degrees under vacuum for 24 hours. Um, 50 degrees with our vacuum is not enough to pull off the DMSO. And then we rinsed them both with methanol just to make sure there was no residual DMSO there because that probably would interfere with our electrochemistry. Um, oh, I don't think we needed to do that. And then we looked at there. And now we did cross sections. And so you can see on the left, poly-3-hexylthiophene um, cross section. And you can sort of see. I don't know if it'll make any difference. No. Sort of see that um, there aren't really any pores in here. It's just sort of a solid chunk of polymer here. And then from the top, you can see there's some pitting in the polymer film, but it's not rough surface like we saw before. If we look at the co-cast one now, we see something completely different. We've got pores throughout. And again, I'm sorry, it's hard to see. But we've got pores all through this polymer film. And, um, and we're definitely looking at, at more surface roughness on the top. And so that we plotted. Now, the anodic peak current, how big was that current response versus the volume of DMSO that we added? And you can see as we get up into that sweet spot, which is highlighted here in yellow, that 28 to 34 percent, we get to much higher, um, much higher current response. And so ultimately, what I'd like is the other half of this curve, and I'd like to see it come back down, right? I don't have that because what happens is the polymer film falls apart, right? As you, as you get beyond, 
if you start having more solvent than you have polymer, the, the film loses cohesion and just falls apart. So I do know that adding DMSO where we think we need to gives us much better electroactivity. Um, so then we looked at other things. Okay, so now we've done DMSO, we've done uh, EMI BTI. What other things could we use as a porogen? And so we changed the polymer. So this is polydibutyl prodot here um, because we wanted to get that oxidation potential a little bit lower than P3HT. Uh, but we still wanted a soluble polymer, so this gives us that. And so we tried DMSO and we tried 1,4-dioxane and you'll see that the red trace here is the DMSO, the blue trace is the dioxane. So DMSO works a little bit better than the dioxane um, for, for increasing the porosity of the film. Uh, we've also looked at ethanolamine, which looked great, gave us really beautiful porous looking films with the electrochemistry is no good, don't know why. Um, have some theories, but uh, no proof. So, um, so now we've done this, but we haven't tried all these other concentrations or anything like that. So what could we do instead of that templating? Well, how about emulsion polymerization? It's sort of the opposite. It's making nanoparticles of polymer. So instead of, instead of large amounts of pores with a little bit of polymer, now we're talking about lots of little balls of polymer and space in between them because they don't pack well. Um, and so certainly people have spent a lot of time looking at emulsion polymerization. There are some potential issues with this in terms of, you know, what is the surfactant that you're using? How does that interfere with your electrochemistry? Um, how do you optimize that? Or you really have to, to tailor it for each and every polymer. Um, so my one and only actual synthesis slide other than the mechanism of polymerization. Um, you should have all seen most of these reactions before. We've got... <laughs> It's okay, just do like this. <laughs> Cover your ears, la, la, la. Uh, <laughs> um, so we're deprotonating these, these acidic hydrogens on hydroquinone, uh, making a diphenoxide, adding that to an alkyl halide, doing a substitution reaction, making a diether. That diether we can then brominate, right? Electrophilic aromatic substitution, we know that reaction. Because it's already got these electron donating groups on there, we don't have to add any Lewis acid catalyst. It just works beautifully and we make a dibromodioxybenzene. Um, we can do that with any kind of R group on here we want. Uh, so you can see I've got one with the C6 and one with this ester. We picked the ester on purpose because we wanted something that we could remove later and put on a biomolecule because we were starting to look at biomedical applications. So we wanted to be able to stick aptamers and things out here where this ethyl group is. Um, and so, so we designed an ester. Um, and then we've got these two dibromodialkoxybenzenes and we're doing coupling chemistry. And depending on what book you learn for OCHEM, you use for OCHEM and whoever your professor was, you might have learned about some of these. Um, but we're essentially just making carbon-carbon bonds in aromatic systems. And this is what's known as a Nagishi coupling, uses a palladium catalyst and zinc as the metal. And we're making a bis edot dialkoxybenzene. Now you'll notice M2 and M3 here, where M2 is the C6 chain, M3 is the ester side chain. There was an M1, we won't talk about M1. It, doesn't, it didn't end well. Um, and so you take those and by some means, you polymerize them to make polymers P2 and P3, where P2 would have the, six, uh, the, the, the hexaloxy. Um, we can do the oxidative electrochemical polymerization like I showed you earlier. We can do oxidative chemical polymerization in solution or in emulsion. And there are also some non-oxidative techniques, again, coupling chemistry to let you uh, polymerize. So there are all sorts of things that we can do to make those polymers. Um, electrochemical polymerization, I told you about it before here. You can actually see it where we've got the um, monomer electrolyte solution down here. We've got our working electrode being either indium tin oxide coated glass, so conductive glass, so we can deposit uh, polymer everywhere that's submerged in solution. Uh, we've got a reference electrode, which in this case is a silver wire, could be a silver, silver chloride, silver, silver plus reference electrode. And we've got a platinum flag to be the source and sink for the electrons that we are working with. Um, and we apply that voltage and we get exactly what I showed you before, only now with these two different monomers. Now the onset of the monomer oxidation is minus 0.1 for the dihexyloxy. That's pretty close, I think, to what the E dot was by itself. With the esters, it's quite a bit higher. Remember that ester group is electron withdrawing, right? So that carbonyl next to that carbon, that's pulling electron density away from the ring system, making it harder to oxidize, raising the oxidation potential, and we see that. So we've polymerized both of these monomers to make those two polymers. We've then looked, and this is just solution electropolymerization, and then we've looked at the polymer electrochemistry, same sort of thing, the uh, hexaloxy 
is easier to oxidize than the ester substituted polymer. Um, but both of them do electropolymerize quite nicely. Um, then we looked at the emulsion polymerization and it took a while. We tried a bunch of things. What we figured out was we needed an organic phase that contained the monomer, the chloroform, and a surfactant being dodecyl benzene sulfonic acid. So that, that dodecyl benzene part, that's the nonpolar tail, and that's this little black squiggle. And then we've got this sulfonic acid group, which is the polar head, which is that green circle. Um, when you drop that into water, you form micelles, right? With, with the nonpolar on the inside near the monomer and the chloroform, and the polar on the outside. That, that acid group is on the outside in the water. And so that's what this is representing right here. Now, we're not just dropping it straight into water. We're dropping it into water that contains polystyrene sulfonic acid, comalaic acid, PSS CoMa. Um, water-soluble polymer, and so that's these little green squiggles here. And as we add the monomer solution dropwise to the water, we create these little micelles that have sort of a coating of the PSS CoMa on the outside. We then add dropwise to that the ferric chloride, which is a chemical oxidant, and we get that monomer, remove electrons from it, convert it to polymer, and then the iron three chloride is converted to iron two. And so we end up with a conducting polymer core inside that micelle, and we end up with polymer nanoparticles. And depending on the concentrations um, of all the different things that we use, we can control the size of the nanoparticles that we make. So these are about 80 to 100 nanometer uh, particles here. You can see a, an image of those. We then take those and we centrifuge and collect the nanoparticles, which we can then study. Um, so what size do we want? Eh, under 200 nanometers. For what, you might ask? Well, that's, that's where it gets really interesting. Um, when we looked at the UV-Vis spectra of these polymers, what we saw, and the purple trace down here is the monomer, pretty much nothing going on between 500 and 900 nanometers. The green one is the reduced polymer, certainly nothing going on between 700 and 900 nanometers. And then up here, the, the, the blue and the red at the top, those are the oxidized suspension, those nanoparticles suspended in a non-solvent. Um, or the polymer film deposited on the electrode. And they both absorb at about 750 nanometers for the dihexaloxy, 790-ish for the diester. Um, absorption in that near-infrared window between 700 and 900 nanometers makes these incredibly useful for something called photothermal ablation therapy, which is when light hits these materials at in this wavelength, they absorb. We see that. If they absorb, What's happening? We're promoting electrons from the highest occupied molecular orbital, the HOMO, to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, which is the LUMO. What happens next? Those electrons are going to relax, right? The energy is going to dissipate. How is it going to dissipate? Either as heat or as light. If it dissipates as light, we've got fluorescent materials. And they do absolutely fluoresce. But they also give off heat. And if they give off heat, when they're irradiated between 700 and 900 nanometers, that is potentially very, very useful for killing tumors, destroying tumor cells. Because your body doesn't really absorb light in the 700 to 900 nanometer range. Your tissues are fairly transmissive in that region. So imagine you inject, you have breast cancer, you've got a tumor right here. You inject into that tumor something that absorbs light in that wavelength and emits it as heat, right? If the temperature in a one centimeter diameter or one centimeter radius, it's spherical, of, of that polymer increases by 10 degrees, that's enough to destroy the tumor cells. Breast cancer and a lot of other tumors, they tend to have well-defined margins. So a centimeter, that works really, really well. So absorbing between 700 and 900 nanometers we, means we can irradiate from outside the body with light, kill the tumor, destroy the tumor, and w by just giving off a little bit of heat. Think about this, you're no, no chemotherapy, you're not getting sick from drugs that are going throughout your entire body, no radiation therapy, right? So you're not gonna get as sick. So this is minimally evasive, site-specific treatment of tumors. Um, people are doing this now currently with gold nanoparticles. They work, but you know what your insurance company says if you say, I needed a gold treatment? They don't like that. Right? So, and, and, and then what happens to the gold? It sits in there, right? So going with something organic, inexpensive, biodegradable um, is a much better option. So we have developed nanoparticles that we can use to treat tumors. Um, do we know that this works? Yes, we do. So what do they need to be? They need to absorb in that 700 and 900 nanometer region. They need to be below 200 nanometers in size. 
um, for a variety of reasons, and they need to be biocompatible. And so we've made them biocompatible with these shells that we're putting on them when we're creating the micelles. Um, and I'll show you, I think I have the cytotoxicity results. And then we have some, we do photothermal measurements. So again, this is where our collaborators at UT come in handy with their medical imaging. Um, and what we do is we have a 96 wall plate. We're putting these, uh, these, these nanoparticles in them. We're irradiating them between 700 and 900 nanometers. And we're measuring, and then we're turning off the radiation and measuring with an IR camera how much heat is generated. And so you can see over here, and, and this all looks very, very fancy, but this is a cheapo free styrofoam cooler that they ship us chemicals in. That, that we built this in so that we could control the temperature. Um, so, so really very simple device. And then sometimes we needed to use um, a light bulb to control the, the, the regular temperature. Um, and so what we're looking over here at is the temperature change as a function of time after irradiation. So, so, after, uh, so you can see that, that very, very quickly these things are giving off heat Photothermal efficiency, I didn't bring you all the equations that show how we calculate that. But we've essentially tried three different polymers, the P2 and P3 that I showed you, and also that P dot um, with a polystyrene sulfonate counter ion. And so they're all good at taking that light and converting it to heat. Uh, the P2 and P3 uh, seem to do it perhaps quite a bit better. Um, and so we can look, and again, yeah, you can't see it at all. I promise that these pictures over here are a bunch of little red dots. Um, the green dots here are live tumor cells. So these are breast cancer cells, this MDA, MB231 line, which means something if you're a biomedical engineer. But to me, it's just a bunch of letters. Um, breast cancer cells. So we take breast cancer cells, we put them in there with the polymer, and we look at whether or not um, we can kill those cancer cells. And so what we saw, it was very concentration dependent. At 10 to 50 micrograms per milliliter, we are completely destroying all of the cancer cells within five minutes of exposure. With uh, lower concentrations being 1 in 0.5 micrograms per milliliter, it takes about 10 minutes. And so um, by having controls, we can show that this is not just due to light. The polymer actually has to be in there to make those things die. Um, as long as we stay below concentrations of 55 micrograms per milliliter of those polymers, the nanoparticles are cytocompatible, which means that 80% of the cells will live when exposed to them, right? We're not, we're not just, and this is normal cells, right? We're not killing normal cells by exposing them to this polymer, at least not 80% of them, as long as we keep below those concentrations. Now, we think we can get that number even higher by changing the surfactants, because a lot of cells are killed by surfactants. And so we can get really, really good cell death. Um, so we know that we can uh, do this. But we haven't done any in vivo studies yet. So far, everything's been in 96 well plates, right? We're not working with rats or anything. We, we need a lot more money to be able to do that. Um, so what do we know? We know that adding the porogens to the polymer during film casting significantly improves electrochemical performance, meaning we can make much better capacitors, much better sensors. Um, but it's not as simple as just throwing ionic liquid into everything you make. You have to choose carefully. Uh, and we also know that we have promising photothermal therapy agents in these particular polymers. Um, we are working on other templating experiments. We're also working further on the photothermal studies. So I said you'd inj inject this directly into a tumor, which you can do with uh, ultrasound. You can guide that. But ideally, what you'd like is just take a pill and have that pill have something on it that, that your body would say, oh, I know what to do with these, these kind of chemicals. They belong in breast tissue. And your body would automatically just send all of that chemical directly to the tissue that is going to have the cancer in it. And that is possible. And so again, not really my thing, because I'm a chemist. I can work on the, the chemical functionality of it. But the biomedical engineer is now uh, targeting those specific molecules to go directly into the, the cancer cells. So you wouldn't have to worry about injecting it. And um, we're also working on other ways of getting molecular weights higher and doing more studies on these things. And that's it. Um, we did all of this research with a grant from the National Science Foundation, which has been very, very helpful. And they've been very good to us. Um, and that's, that's all I have. Are like, 
those they either use as like cathodes or battery or Cathodes and anodes, right? Oxidation yeah. occurs at the anode. Yeah. So the p-doping, those polymers that do p-doping well, which is the p-dots and, and the p3-HTs, all that kind of stuff, those are great anodes for batteries. Um, that, that BBL polymer that I showed you, that'd be a cathode. So we're talking about an all-polymer device. So right now, if you see polymer, polymer capacitors, they've got a polymer at one electrode, and then they've got something inorganic at the other electrode. And that inorganic is um, potentially bad for the environment, right? What is there like, um, you know, like the, the capacity of these compared to like using metals or? So, so the best inorganic for a capacitor is ruthenium oxide, which has a 720 farads per gram is what it can store. Um, it's limited to the size of the, now it's a surface area effect. It, it's a completely different mechanism than what we are doing. Um, where we're doing oxidation and reduction, they're looking, it's essentially like teeny tiny little double layer capacitors at the surface of every nanoparticle. So it's a surface driven effect. So you can only get the theoretical maximum 720 farads per gram out based on how small you can make those nanoparticles. You go any smaller than that and it's just bulk, right? Um, so we now with our polymers, the theory was going in, the entire volume of the polymer would be able to store the charge. So we're looking at 10 times the capacity. Um, what we found was that in practice that wasn't true because not the entire volume of the polymer was accessible. So now we have to go back in and say, well, what capacities can we reach with, if we can access more of the volume of the polymer? But, but right now they're, they're about 300. So right now they're about half that of the ruthenium oxide, which again, you know, how much ruthenium is, is out there? Ultimately you need an alternative. Other questions? Anybody else not a student when I asked the question? Well, I wanted to ask, how did the uh, polymer, you said it was biodegradable? Yes. yes. No, okay, so the polymers that I showed you are biocompatible. Um, they are in theory biodegradable. I haven't done those studies, right? But, but people say that they are. Um, the ones that we're working on now where we're actually taking off that ester group and putting other things on, um, so we've got essentially a peg chain, uh, aptamer bit, you know, that the pegylated polymers, absolutely biodegradable. So that much is sure. Now these specific polymers, um, they are biocompatible, absolutely. How degradable they are, I don't know. I mean, you start looking at oxidation, degradation products of those things and I don't think they go down completely to CO2 and water, let's just say, and SO2. Um, but yeah. Now you said you, you, you wanted to trap the methyl sulfonic acid back when you, you were talking about mm -hmm, trapping. Mm -hmm, how, mm -hmm. do you, how are you trapping that? Do you use a double trap with like a nitrogen? Double trap, um, actually just dry ice dry and ice. acetone. Okay. Um, we had something We trapped it, but then the undergraduate took it out, put it in the fume, but it smash up, and then it just came out and then went down. So most of the work that I did with BBL, I was still at the Navy. It wasn't uh, all the other polymers. That stuff was been at Texas State, um, and at the Navy, smelly stuff in our building wasn't a problem. We were an energetics research facility, so it's a Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division, which means I was working on alternative energy, but 75% of the people up and down the hall were making new explosives, right? Which means that like once a week, we'd, this alarm would go off telling us all to stay in our labs while EOD, Energetic Ordnance Disposal Team, came in and took away something that was proven to be a little bit too energetic. <laughs> Right? So when people are blowing things up on a regular basis in your labs, a little smell really was not that big a deal. It was a lot of fun though. The first thing that I did, literally my first week on the job, they took me in and they said, we're going to blow up some TNT for you so you know not to be afraid of it. Because what we work with is 100 times stronger than that, right? So it's like, okay, first we're going to put a little TNT on a metal plate and hit it with a hammer and it makes a big bang. 
I'm like, okay, now we're going to use a little CL20 and hit it with a hammer. Stand back. <laughs> I hit it with a hammer and, you know, the walls shake. You know, so, I mean, that was, that was literally the, the beginnings of my energetics team member qualification training was blowing up TNT. Um, the base is certified. To keep their cert, they had to detonate something like 10,000 pounds equivalent of TNT a year. And so, I mean, it was California. It's earthquake country anyway. But... I mean, they'd be on the bombing range however many miles away, and your desk would shake. China Lake. Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division, China Lake, California. Um, used to be called the Secret City. It, it was built to be the uh, weapons testing lab that was built during the Cold War to accompany JPL down in Pasadena. So that was this sort of secret military base in the desert. About as far from the ocean, yeah. It, it, was, it was an interesting place to be. <laughs> OK, any other questions? So I do have, bro I do have brochures for, for you if you want to look into the master's program or the doctoral program. Yes, sir? Yes, yeah, so when you are making these polymer sheets with the power gems, mm -hmm. did it eventually did you cross section of these sheets and measure the size of the pole? So we're working on that. So what you have to understand is we're talking about maybe a micron thick nanoparticle or, or, or film, right, that we are cross-sectioning, freeze fracturing under liquid nitrogen and looking at the pores. And we can see that they're porous, but trying to measure porosity is not easy. And so now I'm working with a company that has mercury porous symmetry that they claim will work even with my teeny tiny films. But we bought, the university bought a BET because I said, hey, I'd love to have a BET so I could determine porosity of my films. Now, you need like five grams of sample, right? So I've got, I had to buy a five place balance because what I didn't show you with, with, with my films now, we weren't making sure we had the same mass of polymer on each electrode. We had to weigh the films and normalize everything per gram of polymer. And so five place balance, we're talking about a tenth of a milligram for the entire polymer film. And so yeah, there's, it becomes really challenging to be able to say, um, which is a good thing that it's that little film because, I mean, I'm synthesizing. You saw all the steps to make those monomers. Um, we don't generate a lot of this stuff. It's very expensive at this point, um, but it should ultimately be cheap. I would love to know how porous they are. And so we're trying to get at ways of, of determining the density. So we worked it. Can we make uniform drops so we know that it's all got this diameter and it's got this height? The problem is no, because we get the coffee ring effect. So you can't just say, hey, this is a perfect right cylinder, and, and we know the mass, and we know the volume, so we can figure out the density. It doesn't work. Um, so it's, it's really, really challenging. I had some guy say he could figure it out for me via neutron scattering, but then he said they had to be freestanding films. So right now, uh, we don't know. Yes, sir? I'm an alumna who's an analytical chemist. What environment do you have this five-place balance in? <laughs> it's sitting in my OCHEM lab. Yeah, my, my, it, it actually works really, really well. Uh, you'd, you'd be amazed. Um, the, the, so, so if you guys took a quant class, right? Everybody has quant, right? Do they not have quant? They have quant. Analytical, analytical chemistry. chemistry. Well, we have, we have those as two separate classes. But you use an analytical balance. It's probably got four decimal places. Is your fourth decimal place accurate? It, 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 your third decimal place, hopefully, is pretty stable. I mean, I have people come and calibrate my balances regularly. My five-place balance is really, really nice. We can take that film off, put it back on, do it over and over again, and get the exact same mass every time. So, and, and we're, we're obviously, we're storing the films in a sealed container and then taking them out and weighing them with tongs and stuff. What's the maximum capacity of the balance? The maximum capacity of the balance is 120 grams. But yeah, I know. It's, it's crazy. But that fifth decimal place doesn't move. I mean, you put it on there once you've given it time to warm up and calibrate it. Wow, well, it's a six place balance that's accurate to five places. Yeah, and I'm, I'm fine with that. That's all I need, okay. right? So it, it seems to work really, really well. Um, we don't let the, the synthesis people touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Do they use numbers? Yeah. The synthesis people. 
Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, sort of, right? But I mean, unless you're doing a condensation polymerization, you don't need four decimal places of accuracy. So, so yeah, we don't need them. Um, and I don't think my four place balance is good beyond two places, quite honestly. But my five place balance is really good. We've got a vibration dampening stand for it and, and everything, and it's all kept sealed and whatever when we're not using it. So I know. It's, I could move it, but if I moved it, I would lose control of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's thank uh, Dr. Abram one more time. <laughs> She has brochures about graduate school if you want to take one of those. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.